Uh, as a scientist, we uh, our conclusion among evolutionary biologists is this is the story of aging. Aging is a story of natural selection and its tuning. And so that's what scientists care about. Um, I think more of you are interested in this. Um, it also showed we could easily build a model organism with meaningfully delayed aging with lots of enhancements to its pathophysiology. And not only in principle, but in fact, <clears throat> it's been shown that you can do this with mice. And for the last 25 years, I've wanted people to do this on a large scale with mice, which Bill Andrews would know about, because with his father, I was trying to start a company in the 1990s that would do that in a huge scale, but we, we never succeeded. <clears throat> One of the things that was in the background of this research uh, through the 90s was the genomic characterization of what happened in, in this experiment and what we feel generically happens in these experiments. Uh, in the early 90s with Jim Fleming, uh, an experiment was done which used two-dimensional gel protein electrophoresis to crudely characterize what had happened to um, gene expression patterns over the genome using a small sample by present day standards. Um, our estimate from that experiment was that at least 300 genes from the Drosophila genome had had patterns of gene expression changed in the course of <clears throat> evolving uh, in this experiment, but that was only about halfway through uh, our work. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, we've looked at a variety of candidate loci over the course of the last 15 years, first using very crude protein electrophoresis techniques with a protein-specific uh, staining method. Um, more recently, we've uh, we published Nature Genetics just this year, um, a SNP study uh, on a whole bunch of our, our fly lines. This massively replicated work, but focusing on a, on a handful of regions in the chromosome. Um, the way to characterize this work overall is that um, it's actually very easy to find loci that are differentiating either in gene expression or allele frequency in the course of this experiment. Um, among the loci that are readily uh, detected are loci involved in energetic metabolism. Uh, superoxide dismutase is also one of the responders, for those of you who are advocates of the free radical theory of aging. Um, and this fit with the variety of physiological results we obtained on energetic metabolism in these flies. Um, one of the most suspicious things about this body of results, of course, is that it, it's been so easy for us and indeed for other labs like Leo Luckenbill's lab to find these loci, um, which of course motivated us to uh, pursue whole genome approaches, which is where we are now in the 21st century. And now I should point out this is work that is done by the corporation Genesient. LLC um, and not work done in my lab. And I'm going to try to make it clear from here forward what has been done in my lab and what they have done outside of the University of California. <clears throat> if you do genome-wide gene expression studies on replicated populations of longer-lived fruit flies compared to their controls, uh, what Genesient found was more than 1,000 loci out of about 14,000 loci in the Drosophila genome that have very substantially changed gene expression patterns with low false discovery rates. And the statistical significance on these results is massive. Um, <clears throat> that tells us very much in keeping with the perspectives of evolutionary theorists that you have extensive changes occurring genome-wide at the level of gene expression. Um, uh, What's more interesting for this audience is because we're talking about a genomic result and genomes of bilaterally symmetric segmented metasomes, and that's what you guys are too, just like insects, actually use a common genomic toolkit. And if you look at uh, how much carryover you get from the uh, significantly differentiated fly genes from this one experiment to how many of those loci actually have significant uh, corresponding or orthologous genes in the human genome, we get better than 80%. And that's because these genes are basically metabolic housekeeping genes. They're not special magic genes specific to fruit fly lifestyle. They're really basic things involving energetic metabolism. You could think of them as repair pathways, regulatory pathways, and so on, but they're all in common, at least I'd say of those 80 to 90%. Even more interestingly, what Genesient has done is it's taken some of those orthologous 
genes and check human genomic databases for evidence as to whether or not those loci are in fact significant in chronic age-associated diseases. And basically, as the human genomics get better and better, we're finding more and more cross-platform or cross-species uh, corroboration. That is to say, uh, and of course our fly genomics are way better than our human genomics with respect to aging and aging associated diseases, but basically as the human genomics get better and better, we find more and more correspondence. I think at saturation, when we've got fantastic human genomics, which we probably will in around two years, thanks to Kaiser, um, we'll find on the order of 50 to 70 percent correspondence. So to me, crudely speaking, from a technological standpoint, not a scientific standpoint, it's like the longer-lived fruit flies that I produced are a 50 to 70 percent solution for humans. So if we could do for humans by biochemical manipulation uh, what evolution has done in my lab for the fruit flies, then we would have 50 to 70 percent of a fourfold lifespan extension, so taking it back on the order of a two-fold uh, lifespan extension. Actually, I properly should say health span extension. Um, so, uh, as a scientist, what the interesting part of this is, um, these genomic discoveries by Genesient uh, have also indicated that the uh, aging genomics of humans are comparably complex to the aging genomics of fruit flies. That there are not a handful of pathways or a handful of things to repair or whatever. There are hundreds. Um, as there are in fruit flies. And also that we can, in fact, at least to some extent, maybe 50 to 70 percent, use the fruit fly genomics as specific guidance for uh, approaching uh, human uh, interventions. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, basically, this is the 21st century world of aging. It's nothing like what we were talking about in the 20th century. It's not simple pathways that you could target based on the detailed study of oligopathways by a good cell biologist or biochemist because the underlying causation of aging is not simple pathways like this. It's in fact complex networks and that's actually old-fashioned 20th century views of physiological networks. Actually our networks look more like this. Uh, vastly complex networks like those that characterize you know, the, hum the uh, American economy. Uh, nothing like how we used to think of pathways. In fact, the whole term pathway is probably wrong. Uh, bad way to think of things. And um, non-trivially, Drosophila is becoming a very hot uh, upstream uh, pharmaceutical tool for developing R&D. And that, our genomics, Genesian's genomics uh, suggest, is uh, expected in that you have 50 to 70 percent overlap in the genomic toolkit. And in fact, um, when you look very intensively at specific fly mutants like OPA1, well, we have the same mutant and it causes similar spectra of pathologies. OPA1 is a gene which, when disrupted, causes blindness and heart disease in both flies and humans. Very close parallelism. Um, and you can do all kinds of fun things with flies, and that's one of the things we do. One other thing that's become apparent in this era of Drosophila as an upstream uh, pharmaceutical R&D tool is the commonality in significant age-associated diseases. Now, there are some points of substantial disparity, like cancer, which is rarely a source of pathophysiology for the aging fly. But with respect to heart disease, um, there are some interesting parallels. I'll actually just show you. Uh, we're doing cardiology in my lab now. Um, thank you. Um, here what we're showing, uh, this be a control uh, population, a cohort of our, our, our regular flies. These are our longer-lived flies. This is the percent heart failure. When you do pacing, you're basically driving hearts to failure. And our longer-lived flies are more resistant to being driven to uh, failure um, when you directly do that electrically. Uh, they also resist sepsis better. Um, I, I want to, to offer a distinction which I think is very, very important for the future of Dave's whole mission. And that is a distinction between, a, in some ways it's a pragmatic distinction, between interventions that forestall or slow aging, which we would all like to do, and some of us take supplements to address this issue, 
uh, versus pharmaceuticals that would treat age-associated diseases. Uh, the company that I consult for, Genescient, is interested in genomically uh, making uh, Steve Spindler's job easier by reducing the number of supplements he would test based on genomic insights.